A uh, big short, which has been nominated for several Oscars, directed by Adam McKay and uh, it, ad- adapted from, sort of fictionalised from the book, uh, The Big Short, Inside the Doomsday Machine by Michael... Lewis, Michael Lewis uh, wrote the book. Who you had? Who you? Uh, he was on my Radio Two program last week. Yeah. So uh, basically, this week. So basically, it's it's a financial crash movie. Um, it is in a, in a in a way an absurdist comedy. In another sense, a sort of horrifying drama um, about how it was that two thousand and seven, two thousand and eight, the housing bubble happened, uh, burst, and uh, the financial crash happened, and essentially. It's a movie which sees the impending crisis from the point of view of the outsiders and renegades who saw it coming and bet on it happening. So, to be clear, this is a movie in which the, in inverted commas, good guys are the guys who made money from the fact that financial meltdown was going to happen. And what we see as the film plays out is a number of different characters, one played by Steve Carell, one played by um, uh, Christian Bale, uh, one played by Ryan Gosling, get all sort of independently, but in a kind of, you know, a miasmic group, spotting that essentially CDOs, um, collateralised debt obligation, we'll get to that in a minute, that basically everything is going to hell in a handcart. Here's a clip. You're saying that at 8% the bonds fail and we are already at 4%? That's right. If they go to 8 it's Armageddon. Yeah, that's right. How come nobody's talking about this? You're completely sure of the math. Look at him. That's my quant. Your what? My quantitative. My math specialist. Look at him. You notice anything different about him? Look at his face. That's pretty racist. Look at his eyes. I'll give you a hint. His name's Yang. He won a national math competition in China. He doesn't even speak English. Yeah, I'm sure of the math. Actually, my name's Jiang, and I do speak English. Jared likes to say I don't because he thinks it makes me seem more authentic. And I got second in that national math competition. So you can tell from that. that Whimsy. There's whimsy. There's whimsy. There's breaking the fourth wall. There's, um, you know, characters turning aside, talking directly to camera, saying this didn't really happen. This isn't how it worked. So that last bit that we heard is basically... to us. Yes, that's the quantitative... uh, uh, My quantities guy turning to the camera and going I'm not who he says I am that's just you know again that, that's that's a joke that in a way you need to see him turning to the camera I'm sure I've, sorry I should, probably should have explained that in advance but then it would have spoiled the joke if I'd said the thing at the end is that he turns to the camera and says something. anyway point about the film is that it has uh do you remember when uh the other guys came out which was the Adam Kai film with Will Ferrell and uh, Mark Wahlberg. And it was a sort of, you know, goofy slapstick comedy. But then it had this weird thing at the end of it. that had these infographics about capitalist corruption and greed and uh, and which seemed really out of place with the film, although now turns out that, of course, the director at that point was... That was around the same time that he was reading the book that this is uh, sort of uh, based on. And he apparently always thought that The Other Guys was a weird parable of the financial crisis, which I have to say I didn't see at the time. But now kind of looking at me, oh, well, OK, fine, I can, I can sort of see how that would work out. So what it's doing is it's telling a, a, a complicated story in a way which is emphasising the, the madness, the lunacy, the absurdity of it all, but also uh, is attempting and I think with some success, to make us interested in characters who basically are doing something that just seems, you know, they are part of the system. They are all part of the of the system which is about to implode. The Steve Carell character um, has a sort of sense of, he's fractured and bereaved, and he has a sense of moral outrage at the way in which the financial system is going. But he's also, like everybody else working at this, um, the film is co-produced by Brad Pitt's company, Plan B, who originally had the option on it and had a Charles Randolph script, which was then rewritten by um, Adam McKay. And Brad Pitt cameos in the film as sort of the countercultural voice of conscience. He has a he has a moment in which he says, don't celebrate. You know what? You If you're right, you're just what's happening is all these people are going to be put out of work. All these people are going to lose their hands. All this thing is going to happen. And did you know that when unemployment goes up, death rates go? And there is a moment in which there is a kind of speech which says this is the case. But for the most part, it's not about that. For the most part, it's this grim black comedy about impending financial Armageddon. Now, personally, I preferred it enormously to the Wolf of Wall Street. When I because there is a comparison between those two things, you know, the idea of people engaged in stuff which is essentially not to be lauded or praised or, or uh, with one main difference, a lot of the stuff in Wolf of Wall Street was illegal. 
Oh yeah, no, 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 no. Nothing in Big Short. Is that is, you know, that's 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 entirely true. Um, but it's still the same thing about you know somebody basically, you know, somebody making money in a way that you you think this is this is this is crazy. This is absolutely crazy that this stuff can be going on. So, but what I liked about um, the Big Short was that it was told in a way. Firstly, it didn't seem to revel in uh, what was going on in quite the same way that The Wolf of Wall Street did. I mean, I thought The Wolf of Wall Street, with the, the, you know, I thought both Scorsese and DiCaprio seemed to be enjoying themselves rather too much in, the, in terms of the debauched lifestyle. In the case of this, there's nothing that has that sort of, that gleam or sheen. I mean, there's none of the sheen of Wall Street, the Oliver Stone movie. There's none of the... Uh, the sort of glitzy high life that you get in Wolf of Wall Street. What there is, is these people who all seem to be outsiders and misfits, people who can speak numbers but don't really understand people, people who are basically on some level deeply troubled or blinkered to the point that, you know, that the real world doesn't exist outside of their numbers. And then as the, as the plot is unravelling, there's a device which he uses, which he'll get to when he'll talk about, you know, collateralised debt obligations. And then he'll go, OK, here to explain this is Margot Robbie in a bubble bath. And then it cuts to Margot Robbie in a bubble bath. And then she explains what collateralised debt is. And there's this kind of quirky joke about it. And I have to say, some people have found this really funny. I found it less funny than other people. I found the thing about going over to Selena Gomez at a gambling table explaining to me what a derivative was. I think it's a derivative. Because um, what I know about you know, high finance is nothing at all. I found that less funny and less charming than other people did. One of the reasons I did was because the rest of the movie was working for me in that there was a there was a sort of palpable sense of a sort of frisson of horror as the whole thing was unravelling. So I thought to one, to some extent it had um, that, inf you, remember, you know the, that kind of forensic thing that Margin Call had, that you felt that you really, in watching Margin Call, you did see a company teetering on the brink. You remember how, you remember Margin mm -hmm. Call with, with Paul Bettany? Or, um, you know, a, uh, a movie like 99 Homes, which on the other, ha other hand shows the, the human cost of all this stuff. I mean, 99 Homes, incidentally, has just come out on DVD or comes out on DVD on Monday, I think, and makes a very interesting double bill with this. Um, I thought this was very... I, I liked it very much. I thought it was, it was gripping and funny, but in a really dark, funny way. And... I did find it informative. I know it's become quite trendy to say, well, I can't, there's nothing in there that's new. There's nothing in I didn't know, but I did find it informative. And I thought that the performances were generally up to snuff. It's a bit wiggy. I mean, it's a little bit wiggy. It's a little bit... What? You know, weird haircuts. It's, it's, it's a little bit, you know, you sort of go, that's Steve Carell with a funny cut or that's, you know, that, 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 that happens a little bit, but only a little bit. In general, I thought it was actually pretty solid, pretty decent, and, uh, and I enjoyed it very And I, you know, I did find myself laughing in that sort of scabrous black comedy laugh that you think this shouldn't be funny. What's your scabrous black comedy laugh? <laughs> Uh, your reviews... Yeah, and you'd be, you'd be impressed that I was able to do that. I'm, I'm impressed. You have a large repertoire. 